this, I'm Larry Garfield, and I approve this recording. Yeah, yeah right? Yes. Steel? Doing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. for that there of course there is hey so today on the Acquia podcast and potentially at DrupalCon Mumbai um, my co-hosts are Harry and Campbell Vertesi I'm Jam we are simultaneously as I said preparing for uh, what I hope is going to be a fun session for DrupalCon Mumbai and for a further episode of the Acquia podcast and I have an old regular guest back on uh, who I'm really happy to see once more. Why don't you introduce yourself? And uh, we have a special question lined up for you today once you've done that. Uh-oh. So I'm Larry Garfields or, or Krell online. Um, Drupal 8 Web Services Initiative leads, uh, subsystem maintainer for a couple of things. Uh, relevant point for today, Drupal representative to the PHP Framework Interoperability Group. And come on, I'm not that old. <laughs> Wait, so Campbell and I uh, were debating. I have definitely forgotten why your online handle is Krell, and we narrowed it down to two options. Which of these is true? Krell stands for, represents your admiration for the Center for Research on Education and Lifelong Learning, or represents your deep, intimate, fandom and knowledge of Star Trek uh, and your admiration for Krell Mozek, who is the chief exobiology specialist on Cardassia Prime? Neither. Oh, I'm kind of disappointed. Um, we were close, though. We were close. I really like the center it, approach. It was, I only found out about after the fact. And uh, Krell Mozek, if you actually watched the episode, was not a nice guy. Uh, he, he was actually... Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you, then you I pronounced it yourself that you know that you know who he was. That's okay. Yeah. No. He, he, if you look at the actual Voyager episode, they talk about it in. Um, he was a war criminal, but his name was spelled with a K, not a C. <gasps> in fact, most K's, most Krells in sci-fi are apparently with a K, not with a C, which I find so we're, fascinating. We're, we're going to we get to correct. So we get to in the spirit of open source correct the wiki entry. Yeah, because there's a this wiki. Uh, it spells it with a C actually. Really? I thought that I thought he had a K. Well, apparently not. Okay. Yeah, does that make you uncomfortable, Crow? Uh I am not a Cardassian, so let's go with that. After a war criminal, right? <laughs> so, no, I've been using the name Crow for um, since so uh, two thousand one or so. It's named after a planet from uh, the Star Trek role playing club that I was in for sixteen years. Right. Okay. Cool. It's a good way to start the interview. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Over Engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, please, about PHP Fig, the Framework Interoperability Group. What is it for, and does it have something like a mission statement? So, there's actually a couple of answers to that. It's not quite as quick an answer uh, as you might want. So do you want the original version, the practical version, or the version we're actively in the middle of discussing changing right now? How about all three? Okay, so history lesson. The Framework Interoperability Group uh, began life at PHP Tech in 2009 in Chicago as uh, the PHP Standards Group and was a collection of project leads who got together in a hotel room and said, you know, with PHP 5.3 coming out and all these namespaces, it'd be really cool if we all use them the same way. And hey, we could do some cool auto-loading stuff with that. And so uh, released a, uh, a spec they developed there called PSR0, which was a basic auto-loading specification to have auto-loading in, in PHP with PHP 5.3 work, basically like Java's, basic, in a sense, which was close to what a lot of projects were already doing, sort of. Um, 
just using underscores instead of namespace separators. So the original goal was simply let's collaborate and get a, and push this out to the community. And they botched the launch so badly uh, in terms of saying we are the PHP standards group and this is the spec and no, you can't discuss it anymore, um, that they were very quickly thrown off of PHP.net and had horrible, horrible community backlash and uh, institutionally still have scars from that today. And so very quickly changed their mission statement to just for we frameworks to collaborate. And it's not, you know, no one else has to pay attention to us, just, just us, you can ignore us if you want to because of all the pushback they got. Um, it was renamed to the Framework Interoperability Group in, I think, 2012. Um, but didn't really do anything more useful for several years. In practice these days, it is the PHP Standards Group because once enough projects start following a given standard, it the you know, network effects affects everybody. So. At this point, pretty much any project that matters is using either the PSR0 or PSR4 autoloading standard. And a project that doesn't has a huge amount of pressure to start doing so. Um, the PSR2 coding standards. Most projects that are just random projects have now adopted tooling like PHP Storm and PHP CS supported by default. And there's pressure on projects like Drupal that don't use it to start using it just for conformity's sake. Um, if you're going to do anything new with HTTP messages now, and you're not already using Symfony's HTTP foundation, you're foolish to not use PSR7 or something very close to PSR7 because there's a lot of tooling and, and uh, tools built on top of that already. So the idea that it can be just, just for us and everyone else ignore us is kind of, in practice, unworkable. And the group is trying to struggle to, you know, struggling to come to grips with this concept that we can't, we're not an insular group and we can't be. So what does that mean for us? And that discussion is actively in progress right now. I don't know exactly where it's going to land, but I think FIG is going to over time uh, embrace this position as the community standards body of the PHP community kicking and screaming and objecting to it the whole way. Well, we're familiar with that pattern. And, and it's also yes. not just about, we're also, it, it's not just about frameworks anymore either, right? Yeah, and when you look at it, most of the member projects right now are not frameworks. They're individual libraries, they're popular applications like Drupal or Joomla. They are um, some frameworks like Symfony or Aura or Zend or Agave. Um, there's, you know, the word framework in the title has really no meaning other than we prefer the name FIG to PHP interoperability group. Right, and um, uh, Ninja, it. Girl, Ninja Girl stuff, Beck yeah. Simonson did an absolutely beautiful painting to represent FIG, so I think it would be a pity to lose that um, at this stage as well. Yeah, and I actually, I, I will say, I have the original of that painting. <gasps> Are you kidding me? Really? Yeah. Man. I re it's it's one of my favorites. Although my absolute favorite of hers is um, pull request. Yeah, that's an, an adorable one. Who are the members of the fig group these days? There's I think like forty one or forty two members now. Um, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. They're listed on the website, but I'll say they include pretty much every major project except WordPress. So Symphony, Zend, Drupal, Joomla, um, PHPBB, um, about a dozen libraries like Monolog or Stash or Doctrine, um, some smaller libraries you may not have heard as much about like Jackalope. Um, yeah, it, it really runs the gamut from you know really big players like Drupal to really small players like uh, and Jack Lope and everything in the middle. Okay, we've talked to a lot of people about the benefits of the interoperability era, what they can get out of it. What are some valid reasons why projects like WordPress or individual developers would choose to um, ignore this interoperability movement, not pay attention to PSR standards? I think the biggest reason 
that projects projects wouldn't follow PSR is um, legacy code bases. If you have a code base that's been around for you know, eight, ten years, or even just five years, you probably have a lot of internal conventions already built up, and changing them is hard. Not like Drupal knows anything about that. Mm -hmm. So, like for a project like WordPress, where mission statement number one is backward compatibility, switching their logging system to use the PSR3 logger would be an API break, or at least extra API clumsiness, so they're not willing to do that. Um, certainly for a project like Drupal, switching our coding standards uh, to PSR2, whatever the technical benefits or downsides of that are, regardless of whether PSR2 is a good spec or a bad spec, would mean changing literally millions of lines of code. It could be scripted and to cover like 98% of it fairly easily, but it still means every single patch and every single person's you know, local configuration and, and defaults in their IDE change. And that's not a small ask. So you know, I think that the biggest impediment to PSR adoption is simply existing standards, existing code bases, you know, existing practices, which are sometimes legitimate complaints and sometimes not. Um, like Symfony did a fairly good job of transitioning to PSR3 for their logger, but then logging was a very simple case. Um, in Drupal's case, we just well, we were already breaking API, so we just threw out our own old logger and wrote a new one based on PSR3. On the other hand, Symfony is still using even in Symfony 3, their own request response library, HTTP Foundation, same as Drupal. But they built a bridge so that you can translate between that and PSR 7 uh, request and response messages. Will Symfony eventually drop HTTP Foundation in favor of native PSR 7? I don't know. If so, it wouldn't be until Symfony 4 at this point. Uh, I don't want to speak for Fibian on that front. but. Again, were Symfony being built today, no question they would be using PSR7 uh, for that. That's just, Fibian is very much in favor of that kind of work. But there's already a legacy code base there you don't want to disrupt. Actually, there's one comment that you made in your, uh, in your Drupal 8 launch blog post, which I recommend for everybody to have a read. We will link um, to that. Yeah, which we will link to that. Uh, where you mentioned actually one of the most significant things about the launch of Drupal 8 is proving that it is possible but before, before we managed to do this, it was even an open question, is it possible for an entire community to retool, change their entire API method of thinking and use a paradigm shift to switch to object-oriented um, concepts and, and unit testability? Uh, we managed to drag one of the world's largest open source communities through that and successfully launch a product. Um, it is, you're right, it's an enormous undertaking. I can understand other projects not wanting to do that. I actually have a keynote that I give called Eating Elephants that is that exact point of this is a lot of work. If Drupal can pull it off, so can anybody. But it's still a lot of work. And not every project necessarily wants to go through that you know, the level of uh, overhaul that Drupal did. And not necessarily every project needs to. But I think over time, simply through natural project churn, most of these standards are going to become widespread in practice. So um, so we talked a lot about how PSRs, adopting PSRs help us get off the island, interoperable, so on. Um, what PSRs does Drupal 8 adopt? Drupal 8 uses, uh, let's see, we use the PSR4 autoloader standard, uh, specifically the Composer implementation of it, because like most projects these days, we just let Composer take care of autoloading for us. Uh, and all of our code is registered using PSR4. And in fact, the PSR4 support for Composer was written by a Drupal developer in Germany. Um, so like in parallel with PSR4's development and Drupal deciding if we wanted to adopt it, he wrote that code. That's uh, Don Quixote, uh, Andreas Hennings. Um, we also, our new logger is based on PSR3. Uh, it's not using a third-party library, but it does use a PSR3 interface, 
which means that for third-party libraries that uh, support logging via, via, via a PSR3 interface, we can just toss our logger into it and it'll just log to our logger and our logger does what it wants, which is exactly the idea. That's exactly the point of it. So like Symfony's HTTP kernel takes a parameter that is a, or takes a dependency that is a logger. We give it Drupal's logger, everybody's happy, and we can now log its errors. Mm -hmm. um, we, in practice, are mostly supporting PSR1, um, at least on our object-oriented code. We don't do it officially, but PSR1 is uh, low-level coding standards, things that do have runtime impact, basically. And I think we're pretty good on that front. Uh, it wasn't a conscious decision, but just in practice, it ends up working that way. We are not following PSR2 at all, which is the uh, coding style document. Uh, let's see. PSR6 caching was approved at just recently after Drupal 8 launched, so that's not a thing. Um, and PSR7 is uh, HTTP messaging. We're not supporting that directly, but we are providing the uh, bridge library that Symfony wrote. So you can use PS7 messages within Drupal controllers, and it just oh, works. What's that? I was going to ask if there's a wrapper already out there. So yeah, the Symfony wrote the wrapper like two weeks after PS7 was approved, and we integrated it into Drupal 8. So it's not you know, we're supporting it as well as Symfony 3 is essentially, where it's not the it's not the mainstream default mechanism you're going to use, but if you want to use it. The bridge tools are already integrated for that. And of course, Drupal was one of the earliest adopters of PSR 8. Which has not been approved yet, but is my favorite PSR standard. And <laughs> if, everybody, if, if anyone's been following along with my podcast, I've already said this a couple of times in other interviews, but um, <clears throat> the huggable interface. Larry, yes, yes. I, I, I strongly approve of this initiative, uh, and I assume it's yours. Because the editor for PSR eight, yes. It seems to me, in all honesty, that this is exporting one of the Drupal community's great strengths mm -hmm. and into the broader PHP world. And this is an example of our innovation. Um, some people consider this a, a, a novelty standard or what have you, but honestly, the the warmth and the human contact within Drupal is, is really important to, to a lot of us. And and um, I love that you've expressed this as a PSR standard, so other people you know, should also go and hug each other, right? It's awesome. I, I cannot take complete credit for it. Um, there is a PHP Hugs Twitter account, which I have nothing to do with. In fact, who is behind that is a great mystery in the PHP world. But uh, so there are huggers in the PHP space beyond Drupal, but it is good to reach out to them and have a standard way to exchange affection with that broader community as well. Uh, there's okay. actually some active discussion uh, in the PSR 8Q about um, like what the, the termination clause is. How do you avoid infinite hugs? Or how do you indicate that? It's a selective hug. It's, it's an important discussion. You know, respecting other objects' boundaries uh, with an interface is an important goal. Are, are there other ones that we missed that you implement? Well, not there yet. And, yeah. uh, and no, we hit all of them. Yeah, we've got a couple that are still in various stages of development. Five is basically PHP doc, or evolution thereof. Um, and it's been on the table for quite some time. It's been more time solved, uh, stalled than in development. Um, nine and 10 are security standards uh, that are at the moment uh, not being worked on either. They're kind of silent. Uh, 11 is uh, a container interoperability proposal around uh, making it possible to nest different dependency injection containers. I'm kind of lukewarm at best on that idea myself. I, I'm not sure it's a great idea in the first place. Sounds hard. Uh, 12 is revised coding standards. Uh, it's basically PSR2 plus stuff for PHP 7, which has lots of new syntax. And PSR 13, just by luck, I ended up with 13, of course, is a small spec for handling uh, link relationships and link objects that kind of builds on the same model as PSR 7, 
Um, it's still in draft, we're discussing it, but the discussion is currently on pause while FIG is having some existential discussions, but I'm going to get back to that fairly soon. Uh, are you the editor of 13 as well? The editor of 13. I was the editor for six caching, and uh, when that finished up, um, I'm now the editor for 13. Congratulations on getting that uh, approved, by the way. It took a very long time. <laughs> right. So out, uh, outside of FIG, of course, the FIG is just one part of a broader movement for interoperability and, and standard behaviors um, across no matter what it is you're building with PHP. So what are some of the architectural implications of this uh, exciting new world? What are the choices that people should be making now outside of implementing PSRs? I'd say the most important, just general good modern practices for collaboration these days are you, know, you use uh, a PSR-based autoloader because everyone else is, it just makes using your code and sharing your code dead simple. Register it with packagist because then getting it through Composer is dead simple. Use proper dependency injection because that makes it a lot easier to swap out pieces and plug your system into someone else's, which also means build your code in small standalone components rather than one, one big monolithic system. This is really a movement that Symfony started with Symfony 2, which is the first project to really have a component library that is loosely coupled and then build a framework on top of it. Others have since done the same. Um, Zen Framework 3 is moving heavily in that direction. The uh, Aura project is strictly decoupled components with a framework built on top. Uh, a lot of big major components now are completely standalone. I think that the biggest thing is think in terms of small discrete pieces that you can mix and match. Same kind of Lego block approach that Drupal has striven for at the module level for years, even though we didn't do a very good job of it at the code level all the time. Uh, we're getting better. But the more you do that, the easier it is to exchange code with people, the easier it is to reuse code, and also the easier it is to test. You know, good unit testable code is also loosely coupled, is also easy to swap out, is easy to reason about. All of these concepts overlap on each other. The example I use in my keynote is if you're looking at markup, HTML markup, you can talk about SEO-friendly markup, you can talk about accessible markup, you can talk about semantic markup. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're so close that if you really focus on one, you're gonna get the other two pretty well, mostly for free. If you have good semantic markup, it's going to be pretty good on accessibility, it's gonna be pretty good on uh, SEO friendliness. You don't have to think about those, you just kind of get those for free because they all have the same underlying needs. Testability, understandability, debugability, uh, ability to share with others, all have the same underlying structure, underlying needs. So pick, focusing on any one of those will make the others better. Yeah, okay. So one of the one of the things that we talk about a lot in presentations is every morning wake up and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I will not reinvent any wheels today. Mm -hmm. And that's as a Fundamental architectural mantra will get you a lot of the way there. Um, it, it requires that you're using external libraries and so on. Yeah. So while we're talking about reinventing of that, if, if I could jump in, there's two sides to that. There's reinventing wheels and there's building another wheel. And those are slightly different. There are cases where you just need to build your own wheel. And that's okay because, you know, you only need four spokes because it's for a small bike. So you don't need you know, a, a full wheel with a bunch of tires. It's still round. It's still the same concept. You're still following the same pattern. And that makes it easier to understand and just less work for you to think through and reason about. And you can rely on, hey, people have already realized this method, method works. And that's design patterns. Then there's, and if I know I need this pattern and there's a library that already follows that pattern that does it, I can just use that off the shelf, and that's the go buy a wheel. Yeah, both of those are valid. There are cases where, you know, if you take you know, don't repeat yourself the dry concept too far, you have 
no code repetition, no code duplication, but you also have a ton of tight coupling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a four line method is fine to just duplicate because the knot you create otherwise is not worth the effort. And striking that balance is part of the challenge for a professional, is you know, just learning intuitively how to get that balance right. But, but yes, your first response to any problem should be, what already exists that I can leverage here rather than starting from scratch? Be that code, be that a standard interface, be that a um, just a pattern that I can follow you know, and implement myself. Your, your job as a professional is to avoid doing work you don't have to do. And there are lots of ways to do that. Embrace all of them. And then when you do actually have to do something new, you have all of your brain power still left to work on that hard problem. So what are some of the wheels, uh, some, what, are, what are some of the Drupal wheels that we threw out in, in favor of going out and buying one? And what are some of the wheels that we decided we actually needed our own version of? The Entity API in Drupal 8. I have not seen anything like that in any other system. Uh, I've used Doctrine. Uh, it is actually much more primitive than the Entity API is. Um, Wait, wait, while you're, while you're saying that, because we talked to a lot of Symfony people, what are some of the things about Drupal's NFC API that, that are um, so different from Doctrine's concept of entities? I think the big thing is it's not, you know, Drupal's entity API embraces um, multilingual. It's just a core part of the system. It embraces multiple values on fields as just an inherent core part of the system. It embraces uh, rich fields. So we think in terms of email field, address field, uh, image field. In Doctrine, you th you're still thinking in terms of text field, integer field, uh, date field, maybe. And you, know, you don't have the automatic handling of multi-value fields in a normalized fashion. If you want to do multi-value fields with Doctrine, you either have a serialized array, or you have to build a separate entity that you reference, which is essentially what we do in Drupal 8. It's just automated behind the scenes because we have a richer concept of fields. Certainly, the UI that we have built on top of the Entity API is a very Drupal-specific concept. I don't know other systems well enough to say if anyone else has something close to it, but I haven't seen it. Um, I don't. That's that's great, actually. That that's wonderful fodder that I can throw in the face of my something. I with the entity API and pieces of it, but in terms of the functionality it offers, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah. I often say the, the parts of Drupal that are core to Drupal that we should not outsource are entities, fields, community, excuse me, uh, entities, views community, because entities and views, just data storage, you know, robust, complex data modeling, and content assembly on top of that, that is our core mission. That is our core business logic. That's the part that we need to always make sure is industry leading and is best of breed. We could probably outsource almost everything else in Drupal. We could probably build those two pieces as standalone libraries that we then consume ourselves. And I really think we should, in fact, that would really help architecturally. But that core concept of robust content modeling, display, and aggregation, that is the core Drupal experience. Everything oh, else code-wise, we could outsource. That's content management. That's what we actually yeah. do. Right? That, that is that the core content engine yeah. is. Well, I also I also agree with you that our actual killer app is a lot of smart people who've decided to solve hard problems together. I really love our community as well. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to some of those wheel decisions. What are some of those other wheel decisions that we had to make in Drupal 8, either keeping or buying outside? Uh, wheel decisions, do you mean things that we did ourselves or didn't do ourselves? Wheels that we decided we needed to invent here or wheels that we decided we needed to get from the store? Hmm. So, so the, big wheel, 
the, the big first wheel we got from elsewhere was our routing system, which we pulled in from Symfony, and along with that, a new architecture that then spread throughout the rest of the system and took over, which I'm not going to say that was a conscious malicious intent on my part, but I'm not going to say I was uh, unaware of the potential for it. Uh, I'll go that far. The uh, template engine, of course, Twig, uh, is new, and that's um, been a huge win from everything I've heard. Frontenders adore it, and you know, that's third-party code. The places we didn't, um, the configuration system is primarily homegrown, in a large part because we needed the UI integration for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Symfony's configuration system, for example, assumes you're doing configuration by editing files on disk. Drupal assumes you're doing configuration by pushing buttons in the UI. These are fundamentally different assumptions, and that same underlying tooling that supports one is not really going to support the other, not very well. Would you agree with my contention that this is a manifestation of Drupal's fundamental design decision being empowering less technical users by putting as much uh, of the power of the code in the, in the user interface? Yeah, the Drupal's big value add, its competitive advantage against most other systems is just how much exposes it exposes through the user interface, which means that things that would be five lines of code in many other systems become 5,000 lines of code in order to enable five buttons in the UI. Is that a good trade-off? It depends on your user base. Clearly, it's a good trade-off enough that Drupal is still one of the top systems on the market, but it's not a good trade-off in all situations. That's why you know, there are cases where I will use Symfony or Silex or just a straight framework rather than Drupal because I'd rather configure it in code, and that's a completely legitimate use case. Um, and most of the places where Drupal, I would say, has a real reason, a real need to invent its own wheel are places where it is UI-centric, where we do have the extremely high level of dynamism that results from a, a UI-centric worldview, uh, which I don't know any other system in PHP that has that level of dynamic coding through the UI need. Uh, I mean, um, on the one hand, it, it makes our community much richer because we get a lot of less technical people who can still make very legitimate uh, contributions. On the other, I was talking with one of the rules maintainers the other day, and he told me that rules itself is now Turing complete, which means <laughs> that a user interface logic system, driven logic system is on top of everything else, is itself essentially a programming language now, which kind of mm -hmm. Super blew my mind. Yeah, and I I don't know if that's actually true in a rules case, but uh, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people push back on the rules module, is it takes that concept of programming through the UI to a level of, you know, to such a far conclusion that you need a degree in this new programming language called <laughs> rules in order to use it, whereas you could just write five lines of PHP code to be done with it. Yeah. And very often, just write five lines of PHP code and be done with it is a much better answer. OK, but I'm glad we've come full circle on that. And it's, I think that there are times when any, each of those approaches is, is pretty legit. Yeah. yeah. And balancing that to make sure that both are available and easy to use is a challenge. And Drupal sometimes gets that balance right and sometimes not. I'd say we get it better than we used to, um, certainly better than with Drupal when I started. But uh, there, there's still ways to go in that. I want to change gears now. OK. So we're changing wheels. <coughs> uh, Drupal's coming to the fold or gotten become part of mainline PHP. Talk about how, uh, apart from PSR 8, how this new world of interoperability has allowed Drupal to start making making contributions outwards into other systems and other, other frameworks, other applications? 
Honestly, I think at the moment our biggest contributions are patches we've submitted to other projects. Um, be that Symphony, Guzzle, Zend, uh, whatever. And just being the poster child for this new PHP world. You know, being able to see, uh, I had a, a post on my blog that uh, a couple weeks ago that I adore. Um, I gave the Eating Elephants keynote at Seattle PHP uh, back in uh, September. And afterward, I had someone come up to me who enjoyed the talk and at her company was trying to push very similar kinds of changes of, hey, we should be testing things, we should be decoupling, we should be doing this, we should be doing that, all these good modern practices. And you know, talking to her there and we exchanged some emails afterward um, was saying that she'd been really disheartened and really not convinced that you know, she hadn't set herself a failure. But seeing talks like my keynote or you know, other talks at the conference felt validating and she felt em empowered to go back and keep doing this work to help push her company forward. I'm like, that, that, that is why I speak at conferences, is exactly that. Mm -hmm. And Drupal being a demonstration that yes, it is possible to teach an old CMS new tricks. Yes, it is possible to you know, embrace these modern tools and techniques. Yes, there is benefit to doing so, you will survive. Honestly, I think that's our biggest contribution is just proving that it can be done. And I'm, you know, we're not the only project that has adopted lots of Symphony, um, but I think just the evolutionary pressure we give that way is probably the biggest, biggest impact. Just that, you know, the the proof is in the Drupal eight release <laughs> that it it is a thing and it can be done, and we should continue to provide that example of growth and of you know maturity enough to admit that you can change things. Uh, I, I think that's that's probably our biggest contribution to PHP at the moment. Well, we're going to end up plugging three of your blog posts all at once because the one that I really like is the, I think it's your most recent one about the movie Ratatouille, and anyone can cook. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's really it's really worth the read um, because I, I think early on when we were talking inside the community about adopting arbitrary practices, about adopting so much of Symfony. Um, a lot of the conversation was around Drupal being so accessible for newbie programmers, people who come in and write their first lines of code. It seems like it's so much easier when it's when it's procedural. And uh, I'm what I'm most excited about with Drupal 8 is watching what happens in the next two or three years as we demonstrate that anybody can code with modern practices too. Um, and that in fact, it makes it easier. And if you can learn how an if statement works, you can understand what a class is. Um, so I think that's another cultural export that we're offering in the rest of the PhD world. You don't have to be a, you know, a comp sci grad from school in order to write in modern object-oriented code. We have thousands of people now from Drupal who have picked it up without being in school for it mm -hmm. and are liking it. Yeah. Hey, so in the last few years, you've done a series of posts and sort of challenges to the, to the I guess, the broader PHP world. Um, initially, you know, hey, Drupal, we've got to get off our island and accept that, um, mm -hmm. you know, we shouldn't carry all this liability ourselves. And then there was a Building Bridges post which said, um, go visit people in other communities. And then there was a challenge this year, build something in a, a project that's not your home project. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your mission statement and challenge for all of us in 2016? Oh, dear. I've been wondering about that, honestly. Um, I don't know. Can... <laughs> no, I, I know what I'm going to say. First one was go out and learn from other projects. The second one was go out and build with other projects. So uh, I'll say it now. Your challenge for this next year, contribute to other projects. Your goal is to get your name on the contributors list for a new open source project, some project that's not your home project. Awesome. When you write that blog post, I'll either be very happy to give you a guest slot or I will be very happy to tweet about it when you publish it. So just let us know, okay? Okay, at this All point, right. I'll, I'll get on that. Okay, blog. Yeah. 
We're just gonna link to we're just gonna link to Garfield Tech and then we'll be that'll be our post. <laughs> That's great. I need to put that on the Palantir blog actually. I, I'll talk with uh, our marketing department. They probably love it. Okay, but in any case, I wanna uh, um, you know I definitely want to push that. So make sure we hear about it. Um, hey, so we're collecting sound bites from. Uh, I mean, apart from interesting snippets of the conversations that we're having, we're, we're getting a specific soundbite from all the people we're talking with. And since none of them are Drupalists, essentially, um, most of them have been sort of, oh, hey, Drupal, congratulations on getting Drupal AI out, and welcome to our big community, and, and this is what I want you to do, or this is what I'm excited about, things like that. Um, let's see. So what could Larry's... I, well, since everybody else has been welcome to the welcome to the rest of our community, I'm so excited to have you as X. I would be great if Larry could say something like, "Let me show you this broader PHP community. We really <laughs> got to make sure you X." Right? Or actually, which might appeal to Larry too. Why don't you say, "Hey PHP, welcome to the Drupal Borg." <laughs> Be you don't. To the Drupal community. You might not realize it yet, but you, you've been you've been co-opted. <laughs> All right, your call. What to say? Oh dear. Um, so two two PHP from Drupal. Sure. Or two Drupal. Welcome to PHP. We'll put we'll there. We'll put it in anyway. So I don't want to speak to PHP from Drupal. I don't want to speak to Drupal from PHP because that implies that those are different things that aren't part of each other, or that I'm part of one talking to the other. And that's not the point. The point is that Drupal and PHP are not separate entities. Drupal is part of the PHP world, and the PHP world is part of Drupal. And that collaboration has helped us produce Drupal 8, and that collaboration can and should continue to produce not just future versions of Drupal, but better practices, more robust practices in PHP itself. So I would encourage everyone from these two large, robust communities, don't look at them as two large, robust communities. Look at them as different pockets of one larger community that we can all learn from, that we can all benefit from, and together we can build a better PHP for all projects. Hey, Larry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, Campbell has gone to help out Perry for a minute, but um, it's uh, always great talking to you, and I really look forward to seeing you very, very soon in India. Yes, yeah, it's always good talking with you, and uh, we'll see you on the other side of the planet. All right, man. Catch you soon. Wow.